Welcome to the best of the Leon Charney Report. For over two decades, Leon Charney, one of the architects of the historic Camp David Peace Accords, has interviewed some of the most important figures in modern day history. These interviews provide a window into some of the most significant events of the last 50 years. In this excerpt, first aired in August of 2001, Leon Charney interviews Rabbi David Hartman of the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, whose explanation of the roots of the conflict in the Middle East carry over to today. David, you and I have had many conversations on television, but we have, I think, not caught up with you for at least two years. During that period of time, Ayud Barak took over the government, and he made this tremendous offer to the Palestinians, 95% offer, so to speak, part of Jerusalem maybe, and uh, it was rejected. S Philosophically, give me your input or export on that. Well, I wrote on this, and people were surprised to see that Hartman suddenly responded very strongly when Arafat uh, spoke about the Temple Mount, because no one accused me of sort of waiting for sacrifices to be reinstituted. <laughs> That's not exactly my cup of tea at that moment. But when I heard him say Jews were not at the Temple Mount and we were not here, is when I realized that I'd better respond. Because fundamentally, the issue is what I always saw as the issue. The problem is not territory. Neither is the problem settlements. The problem in the deepest sense is that Arafat does not see us as legitimate presence in this country. The ideology of the Palestinians plus of Islam, official clergy in Islam, is that we are a post-Holocaust phenomena. We're here because of Western guilt. And in fact, David Shiplow of the New York Times tells me he interviewed Palestinian young people and they were taught, look what Israelis are prepared to do. They put archaeological facts under the ground to prove that they were once here. Look how deceptive they are. Look how they're willing to lie. And this is true about a long history of Islam. They accuse us of falsifying scripture. The, the inheritor of Abraham was Ishmael, not Isaac. By the Bible, which we have now, seems to indicate that Isaac was his son. That's Jewish falsification of scripture. The true picture of the Bible is that Islam is the continuer of Abraham. You see, the issue goes back to the Bible itself. Everyone claims to be descendants of Abraham. Both Christianity and Islam and Judaism. And from the history of Abraham onwards, you notice one child receives the blessing and one child is rejected. The same thing happens with Isaac, with Jacob and Esau. When Esau comes back to Jacob and he says, you got anything left for me, Pa? And he says, sorry, I gave it out already. I always say to myself, gee, what would have been so hard if you would have said, okay, I'll give you a bracha as well. How much does it cost to give a bracha? And world history would have been different. World history would have been totally different if a little blessing would have come out. In other words, the, the, the sense is there's a, a blessed son and a rejected son. There's a blessed child and a rejected. All right, but David, you're, you're no, well... So therefore, you have to have a rejected one. Right. But so, so you're, you, known, you're known as a modern Orthodox rabbi who looks to, uh, to seek peace. I am sure that in your travels, I know you've been at Yale University. In fact, you have a new book out called uh, David Hartman, Israelis and the Jewish Tradition and Ancient People Debating Its Future. And to be uh, published by Yale University Press and to be part of this lecture series is, uh, is a kudu to you. And probably most of us ought to read this book. But you meet with Islamic scholars. You meet with all types of people. You're not in a provincial uh, shtetl. Right. What do they say when you talk with them? No, the, <coughs> on, the <coughs> on the contrary. We've just had a conference with Christians, Muslims, right. and, and Jewish theologians. And some of the difficult things is that they don't understand that Jewish identity and Jewish history is tied to this land. They've been fed a lie. And therefore the question is not the legitimacy of the Palestinian people. The issue is not can two people live in this land. Two people can. But it's a land that in some way brings back memories of exclusivity and triumphalism. And this is the issue. The issue is deeply a triumphalist monotheism. Only one is the true faith. 
there's only one key to the kingdom of heaven. Who has it? Christianity, Islam, or Judaism? And you have, you know, fundamentalists in all three traditions. Right. Everything I've written is an attempt to change that. But history doesn't change because Hartman wrote a new book. Nor does, does Palestinians change this, you know, their attitudes. They hate us. In a, I don't want them to have that hate. I don't need that hate for me to feel dignified as a Jew. But I can't live with self-delusions. Yossi Balin and many others believe that their desire for peace really reflects the reality. Perez says he goes to, what was it, place in... Portugal. Not in Portugal, it's in the other place where they had the economic conference, Vaduz. Uh, yeah, was, in uh, Switzerland. Yeah, in Switzerland. He says, I came for a wedding and I'm getting a divorce. I say, Paris, how did you have the illusion that you're coming into a love affair? What gave you the feeling that you're going to be now dancing in a joyful love affair with Arafat? Nothing in the past would confirm this. They feed young people the hatred for Israelis, and not only for Israelis, for Jews. Now, this is something that goes on daily in the Palestinian community. I believe that Israelis were prepared to make a real shift when Golda said, who was the Palestinians? There was no Palestinians even. And we were prepared that there should be a Palestinian state. I think Arak is our present prime minister, who's a great man, also would be prepared for that. But I believe that it's going to take a while until the Palestinians come to terms with the fact that we're not here because of the Holocaust. We've come here because we're home. I don't know if I once told you, Leon, if it was on your program. I met with a great Islamic philosopher, Sari Nuseba, who's president of Al-Quds. And I said, you know what? I'm prepared to be a dollar a year man for Arafat to advise him. I advise Hammer, I am advising Paris, I'll advise Arafat. And I said, I have one thing to say to him. I don't want to hear him say he's for 242 or 346 or 549. I said, that sounds like Kabbalistic mystical numbers for me. I just want him to make one line and I think we'll, we'll cut a deal. I want him to say, Jews have come home. Could he say that? He looked at me and says, David, he can't say that. And I said, Sari, as long as he can't say that, there's going to be conflict. As long as he sees us as not indigenous to the land, an alien growth will disappear. In other words, with sufficient patience and waiting, and Islam has patience. There was the grandeur that once was Islam. It will return. And therefore, the issue fundamentally is not political, it's religious. The conflict is how you read the Bible. The conflict is how do you read your specific religious traditions. Many secular political leaders in this country don't understand that because they think that religion should be separated from politics. I don't deny that. I'm against religious legislation. I'm against religious coercion. But you can't understand Palestinians if you don't understand their history and if you don't understand their traditions. And you can't understand Jews if you don't understand their history and their traditions. And therefore, we have to rethink our traditions. As I told Tom Friedman, he who has the key to the past has the key to the future. If we live with the same ugly past that all our religious traditions inherited, Jerusalem, Leon, was not a city of peace. Can't you understand? It was a city of holy wars. Fanaticism grows in Jerusalem, not tolerance, not love the neighbor, love the stranger. I mean... The reason why we're here and we haven't been destroyed is not because people read my book on pluralism. <laughs> it's because we know, they know that we're strong. Weakness invites aggression. Strength invites a moral argument. We're here because we have the will to be here. Now, I don't want to rely on power. I would love there should be understanding and kindness. But Hezbollah doesn't play by that game. Now, I don't deny there are many things that Israelis have done in terms of treating the Palestinians in ways that abuse their dignity, and that has to change. Ways in which we treat their educational frameworks has to change. Ways in which we treat them as a total citizen, as a total human being. We're not just pure angels, but we're not demonic evil. We're right. not Saturn. David, you and I know each other a while. We've done a lot of interviews. I, I've never seen you so 
uh, in a sense, fermented in, in the way you are right now about that whole issue. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. The preceding program was brought to you by Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace.